section sixty one of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven continued john ruskin eighteen nineteen nineteen hundred in approaching the study of ruskin we are to remember first of all that we are dealing with a great and good man who is himself more inspiring than any of his books in some respects he is like his friend carlyle whose disciple he acknowledged himself to be but he is broader in his sympathies and in every way more hopeful helpful and humane thus in the face of the drudgery and poverty of the competitive system carlyle proposed with grim satire of swift's modest proposal to organize an annual hunt in which successful people should shoot the unfortunate and to use the game for the support of the army and navy ruskin facing the same problem wrote i will endure it no longer quietly but henceforward with any few or many who will help do my best to abate this misery then leaving the field of art criticism where he was the acknowledged leader he begins to write of labor and justice gives his fortune in charity in establishing schools and libraries and founds his st george's guild of workingmen to put in practice the principles of brotherhood and cooperation for which he and carlyle contended though his style marks him as one of the masters of english prose he is generally studied not as a literary man but as an ethical teacher and we shall hardly appreciate his works unless we see behind every book the figure of the heroically sincere man who wrote it life ruskin was born in london in eighteen nineteen his father was a prosperous wine merchant who gained a fortune in trade and who spent his leisure hours in the company of good books and pictures on his tombstone one may still read this inscription written by ruskin he was an entirely honest merchant and his memory is to all who keep it dear and helpful his son whom he loved to the uttermost and taught to speak truth says this of him ruskin's mother a devout and somewhat austere woman brought her son up with puritanical strictness not forgetting solomon's injunction that the rod and reproof give wisdom of ruskin's early years at hern hill on the outskirts of london it is better to read his own interesting record in preterita it was in some respects a cramped and lonely childhood but certain things which strongly moulded his character are worthy of mention first he was taught by word and example in all things to speak the truth and he never forgot the lesson second he had few toys and spent much time in studying the leaves the flowers the grass the clouds even the figures and colors of the carpet and so laid the foundation for that minute and accurate observation which is manifest in all his writings third he was educated first by his mother then by private tutors and so missed the discipline of the public schools the influence of this lonely training is evident in all his work like carlyle he is often too positive and dogmatic the result of failing to test his work by the standards of other men of his age fourth he was obliged to read the bible every day and to learn long passages verbatim the result of this training was he says to make every word of the scriptures familiar to my ear in habitual music we can hardly read a page of his later work without finding some reflection of the noble simplicity or vivid imagery of the sacred records fifth he traveled much with his father and mother and his innate love of nature was intensified by what he saw on his leisurely journeys through the most beautiful parts of england and the continent ruskin entered christ church college oxford in eighteen thirty six when only seventeen years old he was at this time a shy sensitive boy a lover of nature and of every art which reflects nature but almost entirely ignorant of the ways of boys and men an attack of consumption with which he had long been threatened caused him to leave oxford in eighteen forty and for nearly two years he wandered over italy searching for health and cheerfulness 
and gathering materials for the first volume of modern painters the book that made him famous ruskin's literary work began in childhood when he was encouraged to write freely in prose and poetry a volume of poems illustrated by his own drawings was published in eighteen fifty nine after he had won fame as a prose writer but save for the drawings it is of small importance the first volume of modern painters eighteen forty three was begun as a heated defense of the artist turner but it developed into an essay on art as a true picture of nature not only in her outward aspect but in her inward spirit the work which was signed simply oxford graduate aroused a storm of mingled approval and protest but however much critics warred over its theories of art all were agreed that the unknown author was a master of descriptive prose ruskin now made frequent trips to the art galleries of the continent and produced four more volumes of modern painters during the next seventeen years meanwhile he wrote other books seven lamps of architecture eighteen forty nine stones of venice eighteen fifty one eighteen fifty three pre raphaelitism and numerous lectures and essays which gave him a place in the world of art similar to that held by matthew arnold in the world of letters in eighteen sixty nine he was appointed professor of art at oxford a position which greatly increased his prestige and influence not only among students but among a great variety of people who heard his lectures and read his published works lectures on art aratra pentelici parentheses lectures on sculpture ariadne florentina parentheses lectures on engraving michael angelo and tintoret the art of england val d'arno parentheses lectures on tuscan art st mark's rest parentheses a history of venice mornings in florence parentheses studies in christian art now much used as a guidebook to the picture galleries of florence the laws of fiesole parentheses a treatise on drawing and painting for schools academy of fine arts in venice pleasures of england all these works on art show ruskin's literary industry and we must also record love's miney parentheses a study of birds proserpina parentheses a study of flowers ducalion parentheses a study of waves and stones besides various essays on political economy which indicate that ruskin like arnold had begun to consider the practical problems of his age at the height of his fame in eighteen sixty ruskin turned for a time from art to consider questions of wealth and labor terms which were used glibly by the economists of the age without much thought for their fundamental meaning there is no wealth but life announced ruskin life including all its powers of love of joy and of admiration that country is the richest which nourishes the greatest number of noble and happy human beings such a doctrine proclaimed by goldsmith in his deserted village was regarded as a pretty sentiment but coming from one of the greatest leaders and teachers of england it was like a bombshell ruskin wrote four essays establishing this doctrine and pleading for a more socialistic form of government in which reform might be possible the essays were published in the cornhill magazine of which thackeray was editor they aroused such a storm that the publication was discontinued ruskin then published the essays in book form with the title unto this last in eighteen sixty two munera pulveris eighteen sixty two was another work in which the principles of capital and labor and the evils of the competitive system were discussed in such a way that the author was denounced as a visionary or a madman other works of this practical period are time and tide force clavigera sesame and lilies and the crown of wild olive 
the latter part of ruskin's life was a time of increasing sadness due partly to the failure of his plans and partly to public attacks upon his motives or upon his sanity he grew bitter at first as his critics ridiculed or denounced his principles and at times his voice is as querulous as that of carlyle we are to remember however the conditions under which he struggled his health had been shattered by successive attacks of disease he had been disappointed in love his marriage was unhappy and his work seemed a failure he had given nearly all his fortune in charity and the poor were more numerous than ever before his famous st george's guild was not successful and the tyranny of the competitive system seemed too deeply rooted to be overthrown on the death of his mother he left london and in eighteen seventy nine retired to brantwood on coniston lake in the beautiful region beloved by wordsworth here he passed the last quiet years of his life under the care of his cousin mrs severn the angel of the house and wrote at professor norton's suggestion Preterita, one of his most interesting books in which he describes the events of his youth from his own viewpoint he died quietly in nineteen hundred and was buried as he wished without funeral pomp or public ceremony in the little churchyard at coniston works of ruskin there are three little books which in popular favor stand first on the list of ruskin's numerous works ethics of the dust a series of lectures to little housewives which appeals most to women crown of wild olive three lectures on work traffic and war which appeals to thoughtful men facing the problems of work and duty and sesame and lilies which appeals to men and women alike the last is the most widely known of ruskin's works and the best with which to begin our reading sesame and lilies the first thing we notice in sesame and lilies is the symbolical title sesame taken from the story of the robber's cave in the arabian nights means a secret word or talisman which unlocks a treasure house it was intended no doubt to introduce the first part of the work called of king's treasuries which treats of books and reading lilies taken from isaiah as a symbol of beauty purity and peace introduces the second lecture of queen's gardens which is an exquisite study of wilman's life and education these two lectures properly constitute the book but a third is added on the mystery of life the last begins in a monologue upon his own failures in life and is pervaded by an atmosphere of sadness sometimes of pessimism quite different from the spirit of the other two lectures king's treasuries though the theme of the first lecture is books ruskin manages to present to his audience his whole philosophy of life he gives us with a wealth of detail the description of what constitutes a real book he looks into the meaning of words and teaches us how to read using a selection from milton's lycidas as an illustration this study of words gives us the key with which we are to unlock king's treasuries that is the books which contain the precious thoughts of the kingly minds of all ages he shows the real meaning and end of education the value of labor and of a purpose in life he treats of nature science art literature religion he defines the purpose of government showing that soul life not money or trade is the measure of national greatness and he criticizes the general injustice of his age quoting a heart-rending story of toil and suffering from the newspapers to show how close his theory is to daily needs here is an astonishing variety in a small compass but there is no confusion ruskin's mind was wonderfully analytical and one subject develops naturally from the other of queen's gardens in the second lecture of queen's gardens he considers the question of woman's place and education which tennyson had attempted to answer in the princess 
ruskin's theory is that the purpose of all education is to acquire power to bless and to redeem human society and that in this noble work woman must always play the leading part he searches all literature for illustrations and his description of literary heroines especially of shakespeare's perfect women is unrivaled ruskin is always at his best in writing of women or for women and the lofty idealism of this essay together with its rare beauty of expression makes it on the whole the most delightful and inspiring of his works unto this last among ruskin's practical works the reader will find in fors clavigera a series of letters to working men and unto this last four essays on the principles of political economy the substance of his economic teachings in the latter work starting with the proposition that our present competitive system centers about the idea of wealth ruskin tries to find out what wealth is and the pith of his teaching is this that men are of more account than money that a man's real wealth is found in his soul not in his pocket and that the prime object of life and labor is the producing of as many as possible full-breathed bright-eyed and happy-hearted human creatures to make this ideal practical ruskin makes four suggestions one that training schools be established to teach young men and women three things the laws and practice of health habits of gentleness and justice and the trade or calling by which they are to live two that the government establish farms and workshops for the production of all the necessaries of life where only good and honest work shall be tolerated and where a standard of work and wages shall be maintained three that any person out of employment shall be received at the nearest government school if ignorant he shall be educated and if competent to do any work he shall have the opportunity to do it four that comfortable homes be provided for the sick and for the aged and that this be done in justice not in charity a laborer serves his country as truly as does a soldier or a statesman and a pension should be no more disgraceful in one case than in the other works on art among ruskin's numerous books treating of art we recommend the seven lamps of architecture eighteen forty nine stones of venice eighteen fifty one eighteen fifty three and the first two volumes of modern painters eighteen forty three eighteen forty six with ruskin's art theories which as sidney smith prophesied worked a complete revolution in the world of taste we need not concern ourselves here we simply point out four principles that are manifest in all his work one that the object of art as of every other human endeavor is to find and to express the truth two that art in order to be true must break away from conventionalities and copy nature three that morality is closely allied with art and that a careful study of any art reveals the moral strength or weakness of the people that produced it for that the main purpose of art is not to delight a few cultured people but to serve the daily uses of common life the giving brightness to pictures is much he says but the giving brightness to life is more in this attempt to make art serve the practical ends of life ruskin is allied with all the great writers of the period who use literature as the instrument of human progress general characteristics one who reads ruskin is in a state of mind analogous to that of a man who goes through a picture gallery pausing now to admire a face or a landscape for its own sake and again to marvel at the technical skill of the artist without regard to his subject for ruskin is a great literary artist and a great ethical teacher and we admire one page for its style and the next for its message to humanity 
the best of his prose which one may find in the descriptive passages of preterita and modern painters is written in a richly ornate style with a wealth of figures and allusions and at times a rhythmic melodious quality which makes it almost equal to poetry ruskin has a rare sensitiveness to beauty in every form and more perhaps than any other writer in our language he has helped us to see and appreciate the beauty of the world around us ethical teaching as for ruskin's ethical teaching it appears in so many forms and in so many different works that any summary must appear inadequate for a full half century he was the apostle of beauty in england and the beauty for which he pleaded was never sensuous or pagan as in the renaissance but always spiritual appealing to the soul of man rather than to his eyes leading to better work and better living in his economic essays ruskin is even more directly and positively ethical to mitigate the evils of the unreasonable competitive system under which we labor and sorrow to bring master and man together in mutual trust and helpfulness to seek beauty truth goodness as the chief ends of life and having found them to make our characters correspond to share the best treasures of art and literature with rich and poor alike to labor always and whether we work with hand or head to do our work in praise of something that we love this sums up ruskin's purpose and message and the best of it is that like chaucer's country parson he practiced his doctrine before he preached it End of section sixty one Section 62 of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 continued. Matthew Arnold, 1822-1888. In the world of literature, Arnold has occupied for many years an authoritative position as critic and teacher, similar to that held by Ruskin in the world of art. In his literary work, two very different moods are manifest in his poetry he reflects the doubt of an age which witnessed the conflict between science and revealed religion apparently he never passed through any such decisive personal struggle as is recorded in sartor resartus and he has no positive conviction such as is voiced in the everlasting yea he is beset by doubts which he never settles and his poems generally express sorrow or regret or resignation in his prose he shows the cavalier spirit aggressive light-hearted self-confident like carlyle he dislikes shams and protests against what he calls the barbarisms of society but he writes with a light touch using satire and banter as the better part of his argument carlyle denounces with the zeal of a hebrew prophet and lets you know that you are hopelessly lost if you reject his message arnold is more like the cultivated greek his voice is soft his speech suave but he leaves the impression if you happen to differ with him that you must be deficient in culture both these men so different in spirit and methods confronted the same problems sought the same ends and were dominated by the same moral sincerity life arnold was born in laleham in the valley of the thames in eighteen twenty two his father was dr thomas arnold headmaster of rugby with whom many of us have grown familiar by reading tom brown's school days after fitting for the university at winchester and at rugby arnold entered balliol college oxford where he was distinguished by winning prizes in poetry and by general excellence in the classics more than any other poet arnold reflects the spirit of his university the scholar gypsy and thyrsus contain many references to oxford and the surrounding country but they are more noticeable for their spirit of aloofness as if oxford men were too much occupied with classic dreams and ideals to concern themselves with the practical affairs of life 
after leaving the university arnold first taught the classics at rugby then in eighteen forty seven he became private secretary to lord lansdowne who appointed the young poet to the position of inspector of schools under the government in this position arnold worked patiently for the next thirty-five years traveling about the country examining teachers and correcting endless examination papers for ten years eighteen fifty seven eighteen sixty seven he was professor of poetry at oxford where his famous lectures on translating homer were given he made numerous reports on english and foreign schools and was three times sent abroad to study educational methods on the continent from this it will be seen that arnold led a busy often a laborious life and we can appreciate his statement that all his best literary work was done late at night after a day of drudgery it is well to remember that while carlyle was preaching about labor arnold labored daily that his work was cheerfully and patiently done and that after the day's work he hurried away like lamb to the elysian fields of literature he was happily married loved his home and especially loved children was free from all bitterness and envy and notwithstanding his cold manner was at heart sincere generous and true we shall appreciate his work better if we can see the man himself behind all that he has written arnold's literary work divides itself into three periods which we may call the poetical the critical and the practical he had written poetry since his school days and his first volume the strayed reveller and other poems appeared anonymously in eighteen forty nine three years later he published empedocles on etna and other poems but only a few copies of these volumes were sold and presently both were withdrawn from circulation in eighteen fifty three eighteen fifty five he published his signed poems and twelve years later appeared his last volume of poetry compared with the early work of tennyson these works met with little favor and arnold practically abandoned poetry in favor of critical writing the chief works of his critical period are the lectures on translating homer eighteen sixty one and the two volumes of essays in criticism eighteen sixty five eighteen eighty eight which made arnold one of the best-known literary men in england then like ruskin he turned to practical questions and his friendship's garland eighteen seventy one was intended to satirize and perhaps reform the great middle class of england whom he called the philistines culture and anarchy the most characteristic work of his practical period appeared in eighteen sixty nine these were followed by four books on religious subjects st paul and protestantism eighteen seventy literature and dogma eighteen seventy three god and the bible eighteen seventy five and last essays on church and religion eighteen seventy seven the discourses in america eighteen eighty five completes the list of his important works at the height of his fame and influence he died suddenly in eighteen eighty eight and was buried in the churchyard at laleham the spirit of his whole life is well expressed in a few lines of one of his own early sonnets one lesson nature let me learn of thee one lesson which in every wind is blown one lesson of two duties kept at one though the loud world proclaim their enmity of toil unsevered from tranquillity of labor that in lasting fruit outgrows far noisier schemes accomplished in repose too great for haste too high for rivalry his poetry works of matthew arnold we shall better appreciate arnold's poetry if we remember two things first he had been taught in his home a simple and devout faith in revealed religion and in college he was thrown into a world of doubt and questioning he faced these doubts honestly reverently in his heart longing to accept the faith of his fathers but in his head demanding proof and scientific exactness 
the same struggle between head and heart between reason and intuition goes on today and that is one reason why arnold's poetry which wavers on the borderland between doubt and faith is a favorite with many readers second arnold as shown in his essay on the study of poetry regarded poetry as a criticism of life under the conditions fixed for such criticism by the laws of poetic truth and poetic beauty naturally one who regards poetry as a criticism will write very differently from one who regards poetry as the natural language of the soul he will write for the head rather than for the heart and will be cold and critical rather than enthusiastic according to arnold each poem should be a unit and he protested against the tendency of english poets to use brilliant phrases and figures of speech which only detract attention from the poem as a whole for his models he went to greek poetry which he regarded as the only sure guidance to what is sound and true in poetical art arnold is however more indebted than he thinks to english masters especially to wordsworth and milton whose influence is noticeable in a large part of his poetry of arnold's narrative poems the two best known are balder dead eighteen fifty five an incursion into the field of norse mythology which is suggestive of gray and sorab and rustum eighteen fifty three which takes us into the field of legendary persian history the theme of the latter poem is taken from the shah nama book of kings of the persian poet firdausi who lived and wrote in the eleventh century sorab and rustum briefly the story is one of rustem or rustum a persian achilles who fell asleep one day when he had grown weary of hunting while he slept a band of robbers stole his favorite horse ruksh in trailing the robbers rustum came to the palace of the king of samangan where he was royally welcomed and where he fell in love with the king's daughter temine and married her but he was of a roving adventurous disposition and soon went back to fight among his own people the persians while he was gone his son sorab was born grew to manhood and became the hero of the turan army war arose between the two peoples and two hostile armies were encamped by the oxus each army chose a champion and rustum and sorab found themselves matched in mortal combat between the lines at this point sorab whose chief interest in life was to find his father demanded to know if his enemy were not rustum but the latter was disguised and denied his identity on the first day of the fight rustum was overcome but his life was spared by a trick and by the generosity of sorab on the second day rustum prevailed and mortally wounded his antagonist then he recognized his own son by a gold bracelet which he had long ago given to his wife temine the two armies rushing into battle were stopped by the sight of father and son weeping in each other's arms sorab died the war ceased and rustum went home to a life of sorrow and remorse using this interesting material arnold produced a poem which has the rare and difficult combination of classic reserve and romantic feeling it is written in blank verse and one has only to read the first few lines to see that the poet is not a master of his instrument the lines are seldom harmonious and we must frequently change the accent of common words or lay stress on unimportant particles to show the rhythm arnold frequently copies milton especially in his repetition of ideas and phrases but the poem as a whole is lacking in milton's wonderful melody the classic influence on sorab and rustum is especially noticeable in arnold's use of materials fights are short grief is long therefore the poet gives few lines to the combat but lingers over the son's joy at finding his father and the father's quenchless sorrow at the death of his son 
the last lines especially with their passionate grief set to solemn music makes this poem one of the best on the whole that arnold has written and the exquisite ending where the oxus unmindful of the trivial strifes of men flows on sedately to join his luminous home of waters is most suggestive of the poet's conception of the orderly life of nature in contrast with the doubt and restlessness of human life miscellaneous poems next in importance to the narrative poems are the elegies thyrsus the scholar gypsy memorial verses a southern night obermann stanzas from the grand chartreuse and rugby chapel all these are worthy of careful reading but the best is thyrsus a lament for the poet cluth which is sometimes classed with milton's lycidas and shelley's adonais among the minor poems the reader will find the best expression of arnold's ideals and methods in dover beach the love lyrics entitled switzerland requiescat shakespeare the future kensington gardens philomela human life calicle's song morality and geist's grave the last being an exquisite tribute to a little dog which like all his kind had repaid our scant crumbs of affection with a whole life's devotion essays in criticism the first place among arnold's prose works must be given to the essays in criticism which raised the author to the front rank of living critics his fundamental idea of criticism appeals to us strongly the business of criticism he says is neither to find fault nor to display the critic's own learning or influence it is to know the best which has been thought and said in the world and by using this knowledge to create a current of fresh and free thought if a choice must be made among these essays which are all worthy of study we would suggest the study of poetry wordsworth byron and emerson the last named essay which is found in the discourses in america is hardly a satisfactory estimate of emerson but its singular charm of manner and its atmosphere of intellectual culture make it perhaps the most characteristic of arnold's prose writings among the works of arnold's practical period there are two which may be taken as typical of all the rest literature and dogma eighteen seventy three is in general a plea for liberality in religion arnold would have us read the bible for instance as we would read any other great work and apply to it the ordinary standards of literary criticism culture and anarchy culture and anarchy eighteen sixty nine contains most of the terms culture sweetness and light barbarian philistine hebraism and many others which are now associated with arnold's work and influence the term barbarian refers to the aristocratic classes whom arnold thought to be essentially crude in soul notwithstanding their good clothes and superficial graces philistine refers to the middle classes narrow-minded and self-satisfied people according to arnold whom he satirizes with the idea of opening their minds to new ideas hebraism is arnold's term for moral education carlyle had emphasized the hebraic or moral element in life and arnold undertook to preach the hellenic or intellectual element which welcomes new ideas and delights in the arts that reflect the beauty of the world the uppermost idea with hellenism he says is to see things as they are the uppermost idea with hebraism is conduct and obedience with great clearness sometimes with great force and always with a play of humor and raillery aimed at the philistines arnold pleads for both these elements in life which together aim at culture that is at moral and intellectual perfection general characteristics 
arnold's influence in our literature may be summed up in a word as intellectual rather than inspirational one cannot be enthusiastic over his poetry for the simple reason that he himself lacked enthusiasm he is however a true reflection of a very real mood of the past century the mood of doubt and sorrow and a future generation may give him a higher place than he now holds as a poet though marked by the elemental note of sadness all arnold's poems are distinguished by clearness simplicity and the restrained emotion of his classic models as a prose writer the cold intellectual quality which mars his poetry by restraining romantic feeling is of first importance since it leads him to approach literature with an open mind and with the single desire to find the best which has been thought and said in the world we cannot yet speak with confidence of his rank in literature but by his crystal clear style his scientific spirit of inquiry and comparison illumined here and there by the play of humor and especially by his broad sympathy and intellectual culture he seems destined to occupy a very high place among the masters of literary criticism End of section sixty two Section 63 of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 continued. John Henry Newman, 1801-1890. Any record of the prose literature of the Victorian era, which includes the historical essays of Macaulay and the art criticism of Ruskin, should contain also some notice of its spiritual leaders for there was never a time when the religious ideals that inspire the race were kept more constantly before men's minds through the medium of literature among the religious writers of the age the first place belongs unquestionably to cardinal newman whether we considered him as a man with his powerful yet gracious personality or as a religious reformer who did much to break down old religious prejudices by showing the underlying beauty and consistency of the roman church or as a prose writer whose style is as near perfection as we have ever reached newman is one of the most interesting figures of the whole nineteenth century life three things stand out clearly in newman's life first his unshaken faith in the divine companionship and guidance second his desire to find and to teach the truth of revealed religion third his quest of an authoritative standard of faith which should remain steadfast through the changing centuries and amid all sorts and conditions of men the first led to that rare and beautiful spiritual quality which shines in all his work the second to his frequent doctrinal and controversial essays the third to his conversion to the catholic church which he served as priest and teacher for the last forty-five years of his life perhaps we should add one more characteristic the practical bent of his religion for he was never so busy with study or controversy that he neglected to give a large part of his time to gentle ministration among the poor and needy he was born in london in eighteen o one his father was an english banker his mother a member of a french huguenot family was a thoughtful devout woman who brought up her son in a way which suggests the mother of ruskin of his early training his reading of doctrinal and argumentative works and of his isolation from material things in the thought that there were two and only two absolute and luminously self-evident beings in the world himself and his creator it is better to read his own record in the apologia which is a kind of spiritual biography at the age of fifteen newman had begun his profound study of theological subjects for science literature art nature 
all the broad interests which attracted other literary men of his age he cared little his mind being wholly occupied with the history and doctrines of the christian church to which he had already devoted his life he was educated first at the school in ealing then at oxford taking his degree in the latter place in eighteen twenty though his college career was not more brilliant than that of many unknown men his unusual ability was recognized and he was made a fellow of oriel college retaining the fellowship and leading a scholarly life for over twenty years in eighteen twenty four he was ordained in the anglican church and four years later was chosen vicar of st mary's at oxford where his sermons made a deep impression on the cultivated audiences that gathered from far and near to hear him a change is noticeable in newman's life after his trip to the mediterranean in eighteen thirty two he had begun his life as a calvinist but while in oxford then the centre of religious unrest he described himself as drifting in the direction of liberalism then study and bereavement and an innate mysticism led him to a profound sympathy with the medieval church he had from the beginning opposed catholicism but during his visit to italy where he saw the roman church at the centre of its power and splendour many of his prejudices were overcome in this enlargement of his spiritual horizon newman was greatly influenced by his friend hurrell frude with whom he made the first part of the journey his poems of this period afterwards collected in the lyra apostolica among which is the famous lead kindly light are noticeable for their radiant spirituality but one who reads them carefully sees the beginning of that mental struggle which ended in his leaving the church in which he was born thus he writes of the catholic church whose services he had attended as one who in a foreign land receives the gifts of a good samaritan o oh, that thy creed were sound for thou dost soothe the heart thou church of rome by thy unwearied watch and varied round of service in thy saviour's holy home i cannot walk the city's sultry streets but the wide porch invites to still retreats where passion's thirst is calmed and care's unthankful gloom on his return to england in eighteen thirty three he entered into the religious struggle known as the oxford or tractarian movement Note, the oxford movement in religion has many points of resemblance to the pre-raphaelite movement in art both protested against the materialism of the age and both went back for their models to the middle ages originally the movement was intended to bring new life to the anglican church by a revival of the doctrine and practices of an earlier period recognizing the power of the press the leaders chose literature for their instrument of reform and by their tracts for the times they became known as tractarians to oppose liberalism and to restore the doctrine and authority of the early church was the center of their teaching their belief might be summed up in one great article of the creed with all that it implies i believe in one catholic and apostolic church the movement began at oxford with keble's famous sermon on national apostasy in eighteen thirty three but newman was the real leader of the movement which practically ended when he entered the catholic church in eighteen forty five end of note and speedily became its acknowledged leader those who wished to follow this attempt at religious reform which profoundly affected the life of the whole english church will find it recorded in the tracts for the times twenty-nine of which were written by newman and in his parochial and plain sermons eighteen thirty seven eighteen forty three after nine years of spiritual conflict newman retired to littlemore where with a few followers he led a life of almost monastic seclusion still striving to reconcile his changing belief with the doctrines of his own church two years later he resigned his charge at st mary's 
and left the anglican communion not bitterly but with a deep and tender regret his last sermon at littlemore on the parting of friends still moves us profoundly like the cry of a prophet torn by personal anguish in the face of duty in eighteen forty five he was received into the catholic church and the following year at rome he joined the community of st philip neri the saint of gentleness and kindness as newman describes him and was ordained to the roman priesthood by his preaching and writing newman had exercised a strong influence over his cultivated english hearers and the effect of his conversion was tremendous into the theological controversy of the next twenty years we have no mind to enter through it all newman retained his serenity and though a master of irony and satire kept his literary power always subordinate to his chief aim which was to establish the truth as he saw it whether or not we agree with his conclusions we must all admire the spirit of the man which is above praise or criticism his most widely read work apologia pro vita sua eighteen sixty four was written in answer to an unfortunate attack by charles kingsley which would long since have been forgotten had it not led to this remarkable book in eighteen fifty four newman was appointed rector of the catholic university in dublin but after four years returned to england and founded a catholic school at edgbaston in eighteen seventy nine he was made cardinal by pope leo the thirteenth the grace and dignity of his life quite as much as the sincerity of his apologia had long since disarmed criticism and at his death in eighteen ninety the thought of all england might well be expressed by his own lines in the dream of gerontius i had a dream yes some one softly said he's gone and then a sigh went round the room and then i surely heard a priestly voice cry subvenite and they knelt in prayer apologia pro vita sua works of newman readers approach newman from so many different motives some for doctrine some for argument some for a pure prose style that it is difficult to recommend the best works for the beginner's use as an expression of newman's spiritual struggle the apologia pro vita sua is perhaps the most significant this book is not light reading and one who opens it should understand clearly the reasons for which it was written newman had been accused of insincerity not only by kingsley but by many other men in the public press his retirement to solitude and meditation at littlemore had been outrageously misunderstood and it was openly charged that his conversion was a cunningly devised plot to win a large number of his followers to the catholic church this charge involved others and it was to defend them as well as to vindicate himself that newman wrote the apologia the perfect sincerity with which he traced his religious history showing that his conversion was only the final step in a course he had been following since boyhood silenced his critics and revolutionized public opinion concerning himself and the church which he had joined as the revelation of a soul's history and as a model of pure simple unaffected english this book entirely apart from its doctrinal teaching deserves a high place in our prose literature callista in newman's doctrinal works the via media the grammar of assent and in numerous controversial essays the student of literature will have little interest much more significant are his sermons the unconscious reflection of a rare spiritual nature of which professor sherp said his power shows itself clearly in the new and unlooked-for way in which he touched into life old truths moral or spiritual and as he spoke how the old truth became new and how it came home with a meaning never felt before he laid his finger how gently yet how powerfully on some inner place in the hearer's heart and told him things about himself he had never known till then 
subtlest truths which would have taken philosophers pages of circumlocution and big words to state were dropped out by the way in a sentence or two of the most transparent saxon of greater interest to the general reader are the idea of a university discourses delivered at dublin and his two works of fiction loss and gain treating of a man's conversion to catholicism and callista which is in his own words an attempt to express the feelings and mutual relations of christians and heathens in the middle of the third century the latter is in our judgment the most readable and interesting of newman's works the character of callista a beautiful greek sculptor of idols is powerfully delineated the style is clear and transparent as air and the story of the heroine's conversion and death makes one of the most fascinating chapters in fiction though it is not the story so much as the author's unconscious revelation of himself that charms us it would be well to read this novel in connection with kingsley's hypatia which attempts to reconstruct the life and ideals of the same period poems newman's poems are not so well known as his prose but the reader who examines the lyra apostolica and verses on various occasions will find many short poems that stir a religious nature profoundly by their pure and lofty imagination and future generations may pronounce one of these poems the dream of gerontius to be newman's most enduring work this poem aims to reproduce the thoughts and feelings of a man whose soul is just quitting the body and who is just beginning a new and greater life both in style and in thought the dream is a powerful and original poem and is worthy of attention not only for itself but as a modern critic suggests as a revelation of that high spiritual purpose which animated newman's life from beginning to end newman's style of newman's style it is as difficult to write as it would be to describe the dress of a gentleman we had met who was so perfectly dressed that we paid no attention to his clothes his style is called transparent because at first we are not conscious of his manner and unobtrusive because we never think of newman himself but only of the subject he is discussing he is like the best french prose writers in expressing his thought with such naturalness and apparent ease that without thinking of style we receive exactly the impression which he means to convey in his sermons and essays he is wonderfully simple and direct in his controversial writings gently ironical and satiric and the satire is pervaded by a delicate humor but when his feelings are aroused he speaks with poetic images and symbols and his eloquence is like that of the old testament prophets like ruskin's his style is modeled largely on that of the bible but not even ruskin equals him in the poetic beauty and melody of his sentences on the whole he comes nearer than any other of his age to our ideal of a perfect prose writer critical writers other essayists of the victorian age we have selected the above five essayists macaulay carlyle arnold newman and ruskin as representative writers of the victorian age but there are many others who well repay our study notable among these are john addington simmons author of the renaissance in italy undoubtedly his greatest work and of many critical essays walter pater whose appreciations and numerous other works mark him as one of our best literary critics and leslie stephen famous for his work on the monumental dictionary of national biography and for his hours in a library a series of impartial and excellent criticisms brightened by the play of an original and delightful humor the scientists among the most famous writers of the age are the scientists lyell darwin huxley spencer tyndall and wallace a wonderful group of men whose works though they hardly belong to our present study have exercised an incalculable influence on our life and literature darwin's origin of species eighteen fifty nine which apparently established the theory of evolution was an epoch-making book 
it revolutionized not only our conceptions of natural history but also our methods of thinking on all the problems of human society those who would read a summary of the greatest scientific discovery of the age will find it in wallace's darwinism a most interesting book written by the man who claims with darwin the honor of first announcing the principle of evolution and from a multitude of scientific works we recommend also to the general reader huxley's autobiography and his lay sermons addresses and reviews partly because they are excellent expressions of the spirit and methods of science and partly because huxley as a writer is perhaps the clearest and the most readable of the scientists the spirit of modern literature as we reflect on the varied work of the victorian writers three marked characteristics invite our attention first our great literary men no less than our great scientists have made truth the supreme object of human endeavor all these eager poets novelists and essayists questing over so many different ways are equally intent on discovering the truth of life men as far apart as darwin and newman are strangely alike in spirit one seeking truth in the natural the other in the spiritual history of the race second literature has become the mirror of truth and the first requirement of every serious novel or essay is to be true to the life or the facts which it represents third literature has become animated by a definite moral purpose it is not enough for the victorian writers to create or attempt an artistic work for its own sake the work must have a definite lesson for humanity the poets are not only singers but leaders they hold up an ideal and they compel men to recognize and follow it the novelists tell a story which pictures human life and at the same time call us to the work of social reform or drive home a moral lesson the essayists are nearly all prophets or teachers and use literature as the chief instrument of progress and education among them all we find comparatively little of the exuberant fancy the romantic ardor and the boyish gladness of the elizabethans they write books not primarily to delight the artistic sense but to give bread to the hungry and water to the thirsty in soul milton's famous sentence a good book is the precious life-blood of a master spirit might be written across the whole victorian era we are still too near these writers to judge how far their work suffers artistically from their practical purpose but this much is certain that whether or not they created immortal works their books have made the present world a better and a happier place to live in and that is perhaps the best that can be said of the work of any artist or artisan summary of the victorian age the year eighteen thirty is generally placed at the beginning of this period but its limits are very indefinite in general we may think of it as covering the reign of victoria eighteen thirty seven nineteen o one historically the age is remarkable for the growth of democracy following the reform bill of eighteen thirty two for the spread of education among all classes for the rapid development of the arts and sciences for important mechanical inventions and for the enormous extension of the bounds of human knowledge by the discoveries of science at the accession of victoria the romantic movement had spent its force wordsworth had written his best work the other romantic poets coleridge shelley keats and byron had passed away and for a time no new development was apparent in english poetry though the victorian age produced two great poets tennyson and browning the age as a whole is remarkable for the variety and excellence of its prose a study of all the great writers of the period reveals four general characteristics one literature in this age has come very close to daily life reflecting its practical problems and interests and is a powerful instrument of human progress two the tendency of literature is strongly ethical all the great poets novelists and essayists of the age are moral teachers three science in this age exercises an incalculable influence on the one hand it emphasizes truth as the sole object of human endeavor 
it has established the principle of law throughout the universe and it has given us an entirely new view of life as summed up in the word evolution that is the principle of growth or development from simple to complex forms on the other hand its first effect seems to be to discourage works of the imagination though the age produced an incredible number of books very few of them belong among the great creative works of literature for though the age is generally characterized as practical and materialistic it is significant that nearly all the writers whom the nation delights to honor vigorously attack materialism and exalt a purely ideal conception of life on the whole we are inclined to call this an idealistic age fundamentally since love truth justice brotherhood all great ideals are emphasized as the chief ends of life not only by its poets but also by its novelists and essayists in our study we have considered one the poets the life and works of tennyson and browning and the chief characteristics of the minor poets elizabeth barrett mrs browning rossetti morris and swinburne two the novelists the life and works of dickens thackeray and george eliot and the chief works of charles reed anthony trollope charlotte bronte bulwer lytton kingsley mrs gaskell blackmore george meredith hardy and stevenson three the essayists the life and works of macaulay matthew arnold carlyle newman and ruskin these were selected from among many essayists and miscellaneous writers as most typical of the victorian age the great scientists like lyell darwin huxley wallace tyndall and spencer hardly belong to our study of literature though their works are of vast importance and we omit the works of living writers who belong to the present rather than to the past century suggestive questions note the best questions are those which are based upon the books essays and poems read by the pupil as the works chosen for special study vary greatly with different teachers and classes we insert here only a few questions of general interest one what are the chief characteristics of victorian literature name the chief writers of the period in prose and poetry what books of this period are in your judgment worthy to be placed among the great works of literature what effect did the discoveries of science have upon the literature of the age what poet reflects the new conception of law and evolution what historical conditions account for the fact that most of the victorian writers are ethical teachers two tennyson give a brief sketch of tennyson's life and name his chief works why is he like chaucer a national poet is your pleasure in reading tennyson due chiefly to the thought or the melody of expression note this figure in the lotus eaters music that gentler on the spirit lies than tired eyelids upon tired eyes what does this suggest concerning tennyson's figures of speech in general compare locksley hall with locksley hall sixty years after what differences do you find in thought in workmanship and in poetic enthusiasm what is tennyson's idea of faith and immortality as expressed in in memoriam three browning in what respects is browning like shakespeare what is meant by the optimism of his poetry can you explain why many thoughtful persons prefer him to tennyson what is browning's creed as expressed in rabbi ben ezra read fra lippo lippi or andrea del sarto and tell what is meant by a dramatic monologue in andrea what is meant by the lines ah but a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for four dickens what experiences in dickens life are reflected in his novels what are his favorite types of character what is meant by the exaggeration of dickens what was the serious purpose of his novels 
make a brief analysis of the tale of two cities having in mind the plot the characters and the style as compared with dickens other novels five thackeray read henry esmond and explain thackeray's realism what is there remarkable in the style of this novel compare it with ivanhoe as a historical novel what is the general character of thackeray's satire what are the chief characteristics of his novels describe briefly the works which show his great skill as a critical writer six george eliot read silas marner and make a brief analysis having in mind the plot the characters the style and the ethical teaching of the novel is the moral teaching of george eliot convincing that is does it suggest itself from the story or is it added for effect what is the general impression left by her books how do her characters compare with those of dickens and thackeray seven carlyle why is carlyle called a prophet and why a censor read the essay on burns and make an analysis having in mind the style the idea of criticism and the picture which this essay presents of the scotch poet is carlyle chiefly interested in burns or in his poetry does he show any marked appreciation of burns power as a lyric poet what is carlyle's idea of history as shown in heroes and hero worship what experiences of his own life are reflected in sartor resartus what was carlyle's message to his age what is meant by a carlylese style eight macaulay in what respects is macaulay typical of his age compare his view of life with that of carlyle read one of the essays on milton or addison and make an analysis having in mind the style the interest and the accuracy of the essay what useful purpose does macaulay's historical knowledge serve in writing his literary essays what is the general character of macaulay's history of england read a chapter from macaulay's history another from carlyle's french revolution and compare the two how does each writer regard history and historical writing what differences do you note in their methods what are the best qualities of each work why are both unreliable nine arnold what elements of victorian life are reflected in arnold's poetry how do you account for the coldness and sadness of his verses read sorab and rustum and write an account of it having in mind the story arnold's use of his material the style and the classic elements in the poem how does it compare in melody with the blank verse of milton or tennyson what marked contrasts do you find between the poetry and the prose of arnold ten ruskin in what respects is ruskin the prophet of modern society read the first two lectures in sesame and lilies and then give ruskin's view of labor wealth books education woman's sphere and human society how does he regard the commercialism of his age what elements of style do you find in these lectures give the chief resemblances and differences between carlyle and ruskin eleven read mrs gaskell's cranford and describe it having in mind the style the interest and the characters of the story how does it compare as a picture of country life with george eliot's novels twelve read blackmore's lorna doone and describe it as in the question above what are the romantic elements in the story how does it compare with scott's romances in style in plot in interest and in truthfulness to life chronology nineteenth century history eighteen thirty william the fourth eighteen thirty two reform bill eighteen thirty seven victoria death nineteen o one eighteen forty four morse's telegraph eighteen forty six repeal of corn laws eighteen fifty four crimean war eighteen fifty seven indian mutiny eighteen sixty seven dominion of canada established eighteen seventy government schools established eighteen eighty gladstone prime minister eighteen eighty seven queen's jubilee nineteen o one edward the seventh literature 
1825. Macaulay's Essay on Milton, 1826. Mrs. Browning's Early Poems, 1830. Tennyson's Poems, Chiefly Lyrical, 1833. Browning's Pauline, 1833-1834. Carlyle's Sartor Resartus. 1836-1865, Dickens' Novels. 1837, Carlyle's French Revolution. 1843, Macaulay's Essays. 1843-1860, Ruskin's Modern Painters. 1847-1859, Thackeray's Important Novels. 1847-1857, Charlotte Bronte's Novels. 1848-1861, Macaulay's History. 1853, Kingsley's Hypatia, Mrs. Gaskell's Cranford. 1853-1855, Matthew Arnold's Poems. 1856, Mrs. Browning's Aurora Lee. 1858-1876, George Eliot's Novels. 1859-1888, Tennyson's Idols of the King. 1859, Darwin's Origin of Species. 1864, Newman's Apologia. Tennyson's Enoch Arden. 1865-1888, Arnold's Essays in Criticism. 1868, Browning's Ring and the Book. 1869, Blackmore's Lorna Doone. 1879, Meredith's The Egoist. 1883, Stevenson's Treasure Island. 1885, Ruskin's Preterita Begun. 1889, Browning's Last Work, Asolando. 1892, Death of Tennyson. End of section 63. End of chapter 11. End of English Literature, Its History and its significance for the life of the english-speaking world by william j long recorded by tony oliva october seventeenth twenty thirteen